Thanks, Dave. I brought notes um, because yesterday John Blake actually called me with one of those panic calls. Can you fill in? Uh, Eric's out of town. There's something going on. Can you fill in with Ian? And I was, I was happy to do so, but trying to do a comprehensive job, I actually wrote some notes down. Um, there have been a couple of guys here in this organization that I've had the chance to cover from start really to finish. Uh, and and I, it feels like even though Ian ended up playing with Detroit and, and Boston and winning World Series there, it, it feels like it was a ranger from start to finish for me. Um, this is a guy who was a 17th round draft pick out of Missouri, wasn't really highly regarded, ended up being the most valuable player if you go by war, and we all, we all count on war these days, the single most valuable player to come out of the 2003 draft class any round, Ian Kinsler. He's played in an all-star games, <laughs> World Series, a World Baseball Classic, and an Olympics, and I don't know how many guys can, can put that quartet on their mantle. Uh, he finished with 1,999 hits. John, you can still call MLB, I think, and get one of those changed to 2,000, because at 2,000, there are five guys in baseball history who are second basemen with 2,000 hits, 200 home runs, and 200 stolen bases. Roberto Alomar, Joe Morgan, Ryan Sandberg, Brandon Phillips, and Ian would be the fifth. That's a pretty, pretty impressive company to keep. We talked about it, and we'll talk a little bit more about the 30-30 club, but Ian had multiple 30-30 seasons, too. There have been five. It's, it's something that actually has kind of gone out of style as the stolen bases has kind of gone out of baseball a little bit. But in this century, there have been five players with multiple 30-30 seasons. Alfonso Soriano, Vladimir Guerrero, Ryan Braun, Bobby Abreu, Ian Kinsler. And I just think the, the best way to introduce Ian is to basically say, listen, we just saw some of the heart and soul of, of this group that was the best Rangers teams in, in, of, of, in the history of this franchise. You can say Michael Young was the leader. You can say Colby Lewis was, was the greatest postseason pitcher. I would just say that Ian Kinsler was the grit for those teams. He had the exuberance, the energy, and the determination um, that really kind of put those teams over the top. And as I've come to find out, he's also a Hall of Fame husband, father, son, and brother. So, Ian Kinsler, everybody. That's the nicest stuff I've ever said about you. This is really uncomfortable. Uh, I know. Um, and the good thing is that when I ask stupid questions, which was often, you would let me know. Other players would just kind of smile. You would let me know. Yeah, that's something I, was, I think I was pretty good at. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's get to the hard question first. What's your most embarrassing John Blake story? John Blake? Yeah. Man. I mean, I, you all heard what was happening up here with Emily. It's an everyday yes. occurrence. Yeah. Um, John is not, he's, he's not a sheep. <laughs> he might come off as a sheep, but he's not. He's a lion. He will let you know. Um, so for me, it was like the big market cities. You go to Boston, you go to New York, and you're kind of getting pulled in all different kinds of directions. And it's like, you know, May 28th or something. You're just in a regular game. Um, and John's not scared to, to let some people know <laughs> that they've stepped over the line and it's time to get out. Um, so there's no really one story. It's kind of an ongoing theme with John that he's – He's always got the players back, um, regardless. And it might be somebody that maybe you know, uh, and John doesn't quite know the whole story, but he'll step in right away. If, it, if it's past time, you're out. I think you, you can probably attest to that. that um, Many phone calls that started with, what do you want? <laughs> right, right. So it's, it's kind of an ongoing thing with John. All right, well, we, we just finished the draft here. And, and I think your story from the, coming out of the draft and, and, and your career coming from, from not a high draft pick and, and becoming the most, really the most productive player out of that draft. Tell us a little bit about like your college experience because I, your college experience was a little bit notable, particularly at Arizona State, and, and what it, how it drove you 
from the draft on? Yeah, I think, um, you know, growing up with my dad kind of being part of my baseball life and kind of helping me develop that grit, um, you know, and that tenacity, I think all of that, you know, just went to a next level in college where I wasn't really heavily recruited out of high school. Uh, I played with four other or five other made guys that made it to the major leagues. And, you know, I in, internally, I thought I was better than all of them. But for some reason, I wasn't getting recruited. And maybe because my ears were bigger than <laughs> my biceps. I don't know. Um, so that kind of started to develop that chip and the grit. And, you know, when I went to college, I went to a junior college first. And, there's no rules in junior college as far as practice and, and practice time. You know, you go to a D1 and you kind of have to be careful with the NCAA rules and everything. But at junior college, you can take as many swings as you want, as many ground balls as you want. Um, you can be at the field skipping class if you want. And that's what I was doing, honestly. I was skipping class playing baseball. So I, I got a lot better there. Your father there. knows this at this point. No, he doesn't know. Well, now he knows. Um, it's more my mom, really. Um, and then when I transferred to Arizona State, you know, I thought that this was it. You know, I made it to a big university, I made it to a powerhouse college, and I ended up sitting the bench. You know, I, I, the first seven games there, I didn't play well at all. I was making errors, I was throwing stuff all over the place, I was striking out. And they had a guy named Dustin Pedroia there at the time, who was a freshman, I was a sophomore. They moved him off short for me to come in. I played terrible, they put him back at short, and you know, the rest is history. Uh, we were playing against each other for the rest of our careers. Um, and so that was, that was a new experience for me to sit and watch the game. And it was humbling. Um, it was motivating. And that chip kind of just got bigger on my shoulder. Um, and then to go to the University of Missouri where no one knew who I was. I was out of my area. I was out of Arizona. Um, and to try to make an impact and get drafted because really that was my goal. Uh, you know, it was, it was a little bit difficult. But... It was all worth it, you know, it was all to develop, I think, the, my style of play and, you know, my emotions on my sleeve kind of attitude. I think that all kind of happened in, in college. So you, you get here in 2006 and you come in and this is the infield of the future, right? You've got Tex at first, you at second, Michael at short, and, and Hank Blaylock at third. How did you, because those guys had all kind of established themselves already, how much pressure did you feel? What was it like being around that group in, in that moment? <clears throat> well, for me, these guys were established. And, you know, as a, as a rookie, you never really know what you're going to get as far as a veteran player um, and how much they want to kind of tamper your, your style. And I was, you know, I was confident and I was loud and um, – played with a lot of emotion and banging things and throwing things and all this. So you just never know uh, when that could drive a vet, veteran player crazy. And the, vet, the veteran players that I had when I first broke into the league, you know, some of them are here and we heard from them. It's, it was really the perfect storm for me. Um, they never, ever told me to, like, chill out. Um, and that was huge for me because that was my style. That was the way I played. And, um, you know, going through a full career and then being at the end and seeing some veterans that can be upset when in those types of situ situations and tell a rookie to calm down or whatever there's 162 of these games you need to relax or whatever to never have that you know put on me from the veteran players when I first broke in was was huge for me so your second year you you've got Ron Washington brand new manager here um and he was the man who managed the the majority of the games in your career what you you played for some guys like Mike Sosha at one point in time. Played for Alex Cora. Um, you played for some for some notable managers as well. What did Wash mean to your career, and how did that kind of stoke you a little bit? Well, just it's exactly off of what I just said as far as the vet players. Then you bring in Ron Washington, who sees the game very similar to me. At least that's how I felt. <laughs> I felt this guy has tremendous passion and energy for baseball. And it was every day, it, it never took a break. And to have that as a manager, um, and then for him to see me as a spark and put me at the top of the lineup um, was, was huge for my development. And Wash never took a day off, and I felt like I, I was you know, cut from the same cloth, and we, to have him come in so early in my career, it, it, it 
couldn't have worked out any better. I mean, Wash was perfect for our club. He was perfect for myself. And, um, you know, it really changed, changed the, the path of the organization when he got hired. So, 09, the cycle. We, David, David mentioned that it was on Jackie Robinson Day, which I thought was really notable. And everybody was wearing 42 on that day. And it wasn't just a cycle. It was a cycle and a half because you actually had two singles, two doubles, a triple, and a homer. So you were halfway to two cycles in that game. Um, what is your standout memory? Because I think everybody's got the same visual, right? That, that slide into third with the triple. What is your standout memory from that day? Oh, man, I don't know. I don't want to sound crazy, you know? Um, we all know you're crazy. <sighs> yeah, so I'm ahead. a little crazy. All right, fine. Uh, so I didn't know I was on the way to a cycle. I got my, I want to say, fourth hit. It was a base hit up the middle. I think it was my second single or something. So I had a single, two singles, a double, and a triple. Um, and I rounded first, came back. And that's when I would start counting in my head. You know, I'm four for four. Oh, yeah, I need a triple. So my next at bat, I walked up to the plate. And, like, it was Jackie Robinson day. He was a second baseman. He wore his pants up. At the time, not very many guys wore their pants up. And there was some, there was like a, I don't, there's just like a different feeling walking up to the plate. I felt like there was a, pre, you know, like there's a presence there. There's something going on that is outside of what I was doing. And for the ball to just perfectly go in the right center field, uh, which I, like Mike said, I hit it in the left field, in the left, uh, left field line dugout half the time. And everything was hit down the left field line. So to drive one to right center field and have it just perfectly hit the top of the fence and kind of just float there for a second, um, you know, it was a little bit out of body experience, I guess. And it was, it was special. I, I, you know, after the game, uh, it's just one of those moments where you're super locked in and you, you don't really realize what's happening until the game's over. Um, and the, you know, the Hall of Fame's coming to ask for my stuff. And the one thing I could not get rid of was that jersey, just because it's number 42 on there. It's Jackie Robinson Day. And it just felt so special that, that it was on that day. You still have the jersey? Oh, yeah. yeah. Where, where, is it in the house? Where, where, where yeah, it's got its own lighting, and it's got, you know. <laughs> shrine. There's yeah. a shrine. Yeah. Um, in 2010, and these guys just talked a little again about the spark that you were in 2010, I thought in game five, you know, the home run obviously was the exclamation point. You were at, at, at bat when, when the first run scored. You had, you had three hits in that game. You were driven to help this team get get past the first round. So take us through what your mentality was. Uh, to, my mentality was um, that we were better than the 90s Rangers. Honestly, that was my mentality. You know, you hear as, as a Ranger coming up through the, org, you know, coming up through the minor leagues and, and the organization, it was all about, you know, Mark McLemore and the 90s Rangers and Juan Gonzalez and all these guys that are up on a pedestal, Rusty Greer and all this stuff. So when we clinched, um, and we were going to the playoffs, my mentality went straight to we are the best Rangers team and we need to prove it. Um, in that first playoff series, you know, knowing that the Rangers never could get past the Yankees and never could win a postseason game or a series, that was really my mentality is just to try to, try to help the team win a series. <laughs> that was it. Well, I mean, you had pretty good comprehension of where this organization was because I think that the fan base was in the same boat. You know, we... They'd been there, they'd been there, they'd been there. Well, you asked me a lot of questions about it, too. Well, Evan's like, you guys can't win. It was, it was always easy it. to go back to that well. You can't win. Can't beat the Yankees. Tell me about it. <laughs> well played. But you did, so you shut me up. I had nothing but good things to say. Um, I remember Michael talking about what it was going to be like to finally dogpile. And he, you know, he got here before you did. What it was going to be like to dogpile on the field after winning the American League and going to the World Series. When you guys did that, what did it actually feel like? Uh, suffocating. <laughs> Were you on the bottom? Yeah, Vladdy comes flying in out of nowhere and just crushes the whole pile. <laughs> I, just ribs are going everywhere, cleats. It was, it was suffocating. That's what it felt like. Um, no, it was just a ton of emotion built up and those, those teams played with a lot of motion. We played with a lot of excitement and the fans like it was just so much excitement in the city and it was just out of nowhere. It just kind of came with a flash and for all of that to come to a head in this just huge dog pile after, after you know, clinching and going to the World Series um, 
on the field in Arlington, you know, right in the middle of the whole stadium's red because of the fireworks and everything. It was just like the best dog pile I've ever been a part of. Do you, is there any, well, obviously Vladdy crushing you is probably what stands out, right? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, so I don't know how many of you have been in a dog pile, like in high school or <laughs> Little League or whatever, but like, it, it's, it, it's not that fun, you know? <laughs> the concept is yeah, better than... Yeah, the concept is great, and it looks great, you know, when you're looking at it, you're like, man, they get put everything into it, and they're just going at it this is incredible and then when you're in it it's just like get off of me <laughs> the champagne was better but the champagne gets in your eyes too right yeah the champagne yeah i was i wasn't a goggle guy i didn't like to wear the goggles i wanted you're to pure. feel it yeah. you are pure i wanted to feel the burn <laughs> Should we, we're not even gonna, we'll just skip right past 2011 what what is your best memory of your time with the rangers Oh man, that's a, that's a really tough question uh, because there's so many memories, there's so many great memories, there's, you know, teammates. Um, you know, Mike, I gotta get back at Mike a little bit. Please. I, might, I might take this time to get back at Please. Mike. Because I, the floor is all yours. He says, he says that he's worried about me slashing his tires and stuff, like throwing a brick through his window. He, he played the worst prank on me that there and, ever was. Please. So, <laughs> I go to, this isn't my best moment, okay? I know Evan asked me about my best moment as a Ranger. This isn't it, but I have to say this. I have to tell this story. So we're in Boston, and the Celtics are in the playoffs. And so we decide to go to the Garden, a couple of us, and we've got these nice seats and everything, and I'm fired up. You know, I've never been to, like, a playoff basketball game down, down on the court or whatever. And Kevin Garnett, he's, like, the star, right? I mean, they got Paul Pierce and all this other stuff, Ray Allen, but... Kevin Garnett, he wears number five. So I'm wearing number five. I'm like, man, I got to go to the team store, grab myself a Garnett jersey. So I get myself a, you know, authenticated Garnett jersey. It's just the sweetest thing ever. I'm so proud of it. The Celtics end up winning, and they're going to the, the finals, and they're playing the Lakers. And I don't know if you guys know, Mike's from California. He's from L.A., and he's a diehard Lakers fan. Yeah, he never mentions that. You know, um, and he's big. When they're good, when they're good, he never mentions it. Right, yeah. right. Very humble. Um, you know, huge Kobe fan, all of this stuff. So I have this bright idea that I'm going to wear my Garnett jersey to the ballpark for every playoff game, for every, every NBA Finals game. And I'm going to take my jersey, my Rangers jersey down. I'm going to hang up my Garnett jersey. And me and Mike are lockered right next to each other. And the first day, he's just kind of like staring at me. You know, nothing. Doesn't really give me anything. Second game, do it again. He's like, hey, you need to stop wearing that jersey. <laughs> and I'm like, man, I got this at the garden. This is sick. He's like, you're not even a Celtics fan. And I'm like, I am now, you know? <laughs> and so I got to make sure this jersey's in my locker for every finals game. Um, so game four comes around, and he's told me already. He says, if you wear that jersey, you're not going to get it back. I'm like, whatever, you know, like he's not going to do anything, you know, because he's scared of the brick, I guess, flying through his window. <laughs> um, he's acknowledged being scared of you. Yeah, so I, game four, I hang up the jersey. I go to the training room to get some work done, you know, and, and get my day started. And I come back and there's no jersey. I'm like, what in the world? Is, where, where did my Garnet jersey? I got that thing at the garden. That thing's sweet. In front of my locker on the floor, there's just a big ball of burning wax. <laughs> Mike lit my jersey on fire. <laughs> so if we're going to talk, you know, like, <laughs> not, anyway, that was my best moment. <laughs> well, I mean, he didn't ever take things too far. Did you, did you have anything to do with the clowns? Nope. That was all Napoli, right? Yeah, that was Elvis and, and, and Nap. Napoli. Yeah, right. you should, but you should take. I knew he. I so after the Jersey thing, I was scarred. So I tried not to go too far, too far with Mike, and especially with clowns. Like the fists start flying. He gets really weird about clowns. <laughs> yes, he does. We, but anyway, we've all seen that. Yeah, sorry about that. Anyway, uh, my time with the Rangers. Your time with the Rangers. <laughs> Besides the birding. Yeah, sorry. 
to be honest with you, it's just, it's just, it's tough to put one moment of time. Um, I don't know. It's, it, for me, I think the turning, the turning moment, the turning moment for our franchise was after we lost in 2009 um, in Anaheim. Irvin Santana threw a complete game. We were still mathematically not eliminated yet. I think there was a week left or something. So we were still kind of in it. And this was our first time close at the end. Um, and Wash came in after. And he said he's really proud of us. And, you know, he gave us a speech about we're going in the right direction and all this stuff. And as a group, we felt like that wasn't, that wasn't good enough. Like we need, to, we need to be better. And we were better. That's kind of the feel of our team or the feel of the clubhouse at, during that speech. Um, and I felt like that was kind of the turning moment of the franchise, and it led to obviously, you know, acquiring the players that we acquired after that with the attitude that we had. Um, I felt that was probably like the turning moment for our, for our franchise. All right, and one other thing, I've gotten a sense, you know, I've, I've 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 talked to plenty of players after they've been inducted into the Rangers Hall of Fame. I get a sense from you that this this really hits at your core. Um, what does it mean to you to be honored from this, by this franchise in this way? I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot to take in. It's a lot to think about. Um, you know, getting, getting drafted by this organization, coming up through the minor leagues, and all of the people that helped me get to where I was at. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I have the right words to describe what it means. I'm super proud, I'm super humble when, he, when you see the guys that are, that are in the Hall of Fame and the guys sitting here today and um, obviously many more that were just a huge part of everyday baseball, you know, everyday Rangers baseball. It was, it's hard to just like put a, a meaning on it. I mean, it's part of your life, right? You're super passionate about it, you're driven, you kind of have blinders on and it's all about Rangers baseball. And we had, you know, a whole team worth of guys like that. And that's what made it so special to be a part of. Um, you know, I went on to play for other organizations, and it just was never like that. Uh, and it's like those, those 2010, really 2009 to 2012, like those teams are on a pedestal for me to kind of set the bar for what baseball is supposed to look like and supposed to feel like. And, um, yeah, that's, that's, what, that's how I feel. <laughs> Last thing before you go. The, the, the baseball chapter is not over for Ian Kinsler. Right, you you played in the Olympics last year. You're going to manage Team Israel in the World Baseball Classic. I don't know if you have aspirations to manage a big league club. You know, you've got a role with with San Diego. You're designing bats and running bat companies and and all kinds of stuff. What what is the next chapter for Ian Kinsler as, as far as baseball goes? I don't know. For me, a lot of it is my my kids. You know, I think that's probably a priority is my daughter, you know, it runs track and is an eth excellent athlete. And my son plays baseball and trying to help him with growing up in, in the sport. Um, that's number one. And then everything else kind of falls in after that. Um, for me, it's, you know, managing the WBC. I think that's going to be a, a kind of an awkward, you know, a little bit of a weird experience being just not being in control or not being able to help at all. Just kind of sitting there. <laughs> Um, maybe putting on a hit and run. I don't know. But, you know, I think that's going to be a, a great learning experience. And as far as managing, I don't, I don't know. You know, I think they need to, my, my children need to grow up and leave the house before I can probably think of that. Before you guys do that. All right. Well, congratulations. It's, uh, it, it's an honor, very, very much deserving. And um, thank you, Ian. Thank you. Yeah, you better